amazing closing keynote is by Don Smith, um, senior like threat researcher at Secure Works. Um, super excited to have him. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the. If we can all give a round of applause. <laughs> I think we should reserve judgment until after the slides have gone through, shouldn't we? Right, okay. SecureWorks numbers, we do 1,400 incident response engagements a year. We have 4,000 networks we protect on a 24 by 7 basis. We process 4.5 trillion security events a day, and we have 40 petabytes of data in our telemetry data stack that um, uh, my team can search through to go and look for badness. Um, so that's who SecureWorks is, that's the SecureWorks advert, over. Um, who am I? Well, I'm pretty lucky because I've got all that data and good relationships with interesting organizations. Um, uh, so kind of understanding the threat landscape is, is, is a fun job for me. I think I'm really very lucky. But, so I lead the threat research team at SecureWorks globally. Um, first started um, this kind of security stuff um, in 1991 when Herrick Watt, the mass department, got hacked. Um, uh, I then worked in microelectronics for a while ended up running security for a 55,000-person microelectronics company. Then I joined DNS, which I guess for the youthful people here, DNS is kind of like what Quorum Cyber is today. We were the Quorum Cyber of the noughties, and we got bought by uh, SecureWorks in 2009. Dell bought SecureWorks in 2011. Um, I've chaired the industry group at the National Crime Agency for over 10 years. I am the deputy industry co-chair of the Cyber League at the NCSC, and I'm part of the Cabinet Office National Cyber Advisory Board. I bumped into Big Jade. Big Jade is six foot six. He's the Australian Federal Police embed at the Australian Consulate, which is where Gringotts was filmed in the first Harry Potter film um, a few months ago. And he's like, Don, do you do any work or do you just go around and talk to people? And maybe that's it. So yeah, this is a sun machine booting up. Janet was an X25 network and uh, Harry Watt got hacked um, over the PSS gateway back then, which is what got me into this. We'll start with the boring stuff, we'll start with ransomware. This stack bar diagram is uh, from leak site scraping and what you can see here is you can see several kind of like um, uh, ransomware groups, mostly ransomware as a service, but not all, who were successful over time. So Conti is that kind of lilac color. Lockbit, for anyone who knew what ZX Spectrum was, is that sort of cyan color. Um, Klopp in the red. And then Malice Locker, who did a campaign against Zimbra um, in that kind of yucky ground, brown color. And of course, why mention that? Because, well, the Lockbit takedown. Lockbit was very focused um, on their branding. You know, they were paying, I think, um, was it $1,000 or $2,000 if you got a Lockbit to two? And they had to close it down. Chain Analysis did a blog post, if you like, which tracks how many people they, they actually paid out of their Bitcoin wallet. And they had massive scale. You had to pay one Bitcoin to be an affiliate. We now know because of the work done by the National Crime Agency, there were about 197 affiliates. And actually, in the, the stuff in the second takedown, I'm getting ahead of my slides, but I'll batter through them quickly. Um, you could see that less than 50% of the affiliates had ever actually uh, made any money um, out of ransomware. But they achieved scale because um, uh, they delegated absolutely to their affiliate. Um, and the example here is this uh, Lockbit's up being accused of being behind the Royal Mail hack and him saying, no, it wasn't us. And then he says, oh, yeah, a few hours later, he says, oh, yeah, it was one of our pen testers. So they, they didn't realize that they were behind the Lockbit. So we could infer there was massive scale. If you ever looked at Steelbit, which was their kind of data exfil tool, it was much more than that. You could kind of put a parameterization at Steelbit and go looking for sample files. You could say, get me PII, get me whatever. But what it also was was an orchestrator. So Steelbit, when you zapped the stuff back to Lockbit Central with, with Steelbit, it did the work to set up the tiles on the leak site. So it was very, very clever. They achieved massive scale um, through clever orchestration and good tooling. Um, obviously taken down as part of Fangtooth, which was the UK name for it, or Kronos, which is the kind of public um, uh, international name for it a few months ago. Uh, nice psychological uh, takeover of the leak site. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed it. A different approach from law enforcement, almost taking the piss out of the bad guys. Um, 
for me, definitely, it was one of the best weeks in the office for a while. You know, you had that one thing, the lock bits up had been banned from a couple of forums, then it was banned from his own website, so three strikes and you're out. And then when anyone logged into the back end, they would get a personalized message um, from law enforcement saying, hey, you should come and talk, talk to us. So super nice and um, a super good operation, with the only one disappointing piece being that final tile that said, who has locked bits up? And in the end, it said, um, he drives a Mercedes and not much more. Um, I do know why that was disappointing. Well, I can't go into it, but anyway, it wasn't disappointing for very long because two weeks ago, one week ago, when was that? Two Tuesdays ago, um, Lock Bits Up was uh, finally exposed. And of course, he did drive a Mercedes because once you know his real identity, it was trivial to find his profile on dating websites, his legitimate companies, and him complaining about um, a bad chipping of his Mercedes, which caused the engine to overheat and detonate. Um, uh, in case I'm accused of not educating and just telling stories, if you want to see how ransomware actors work, if you go back to that, you will see that SecureWorks um, is uh, listed as one of the tiles. Um, so we worked with the police before the takedown to prepare this blog post, and that summarizes 22 different lockbit incident response jobs that our responders worked on. Um, again, I'll put my Bill Buchanan hat on uh, for education purposes. Um, please, please, please do the security basics. I've never yet ever responded to an incident and thought, do you know what, a magic unicorn detector would have made this better, but I've met many people who didn't patch shit that faced the internet, didn't fully deploy multi-factor auth, and didn't deal with commodity malware. If you deal with those three things, then things are going to be much, much better. Um, this is supposed to be motivational, I think, Rich, isn't it? But like, sadly, chaps and chapesses, um, the, the thing is that the boring stuff is what counts in security. Um, but anyway, let's get off all this sort of stuff. Um, we aside, if the principal way in for ransomware actors is scan and exploit, what is the side effect of scan and exploit as a principal way in? Well, the side effect is you end up with more than one actor in there at a time. So I think the most we've ever seen is three, but about once a quarter, we have a ransomware gig where there are two ransomware actors in in the environment at the same time. And in one notorious case in a local authority somewhere in the US, I won't name where, one ransomware actor got there first, did his encryption. The other one was so pissed off, he then picked up the, um, the note that was left behind by the first actor and started to negotiate in bad faith with the first actor um, before the victim had even realized it. So it was a complete mess. Um, takedowns are clearly a thing this year um, and will continue to be. Um, so we had this one, I think, last week. Um, last year we had Quackbot. That was a fun one for us because um, we uh, in SecureWorks write little, little Python scripts which, which emulate the command and control between malware and the botnet. And we can then work out how to tweak that. So you, we can work out what is the tolerance of the botnet for us saying, give us all the C2 servers or give us all the DLLs or, or whatever, or in the case of Emotet back in the day, Give us the next uh, spam, but the spam run, and you get the protobuf file down with all of the spam that Emotet would normally be injecting. So we've got about 30 malware families that we run, these little Python botnet emulators, and we feed it all in um, to client protections. And occasionally you get lucky, because you persist for a while. So one of my team had a Raspberry Pi on his desk on a 4G connection in Kent that got promoted to being a C2 server for Quackbot which was quite fun. All the ex-government guys in my organization were like, Don, we have to throw all the data away. And I'm like, really, do we? But we kept some volumetrics. So we could see all the victimology for Quackbot. At one point, I think we were the longest running Quackbot C2. And we made it into the core config in the malware, as well as the config that was passed around through point-to-point -point file sharing, um, which meant that we could identify stuff like where the actual back end. So for those who don't know, Quackbot operates a multi-tier C2 hierarchy as do most of the big kind of um, loaders. Um, it's just what we call these things that used to be banking Trojans back when I was younger and not as grey. Um, but yeah, so the, um, when the Emotet takedown occurred, the Quackbot um, uh, sort of ultimate servers of reference were actually in places law enforcement could get to them. And as soon as that takedown occurred, they shifted back to Moscow and they've been ever, ever since. So yeah, so takedown occurred. And we spotted a, a fast forward to the end here. You can see um, this is a, um, it's kind of a web hook into teams that we have for any new observations that come in um, in the Quackbot channel. And Graham had replied straight away saying, there's something odd here. That was on the Saturday morning. I think the takedown was at 10 p.m. on the Friday night. 
And you can see him there saying the clever, it sends a QPMC bot shut down signal to the Clarkville pipe server. So that takedown occurred on a Friday night. Graham spotted it on a Saturday morning. And I thought, well, we could blog about it. But I knew there was a law enforcement operation in progress. And I didn't want anyone to think that I had used my guilty knowledge to write a blog post for publicity. So I, I sat on it. I remember ringing someone on Monday and saying, when is the FBI press conference going to be? And they were like, well, it's one of the teams in the West Coast of America. It's going to be like tea time on Tuesday. And I thought, someone is bound to be, like VX Underground or someone, Cryptolamius, is bound to have spotted this module. And we sat on our hands for two further days, and no one did. So that's interesting. I'm sure there's a lot of people harvesting indicators from botnets. I'm not sure how many people have a malware analyst like Graham Austin attached to that as well. Um, so I was very lucky there. Lost all state actors, very quickly, let's do China briefly. There was an interesting China chat just earlier. Four ways that China is evolving. The Chinese are fed up getting caught, and they're fed up once they're caught of getting attributed to them. So they have come up with four different ways that have been around for quite a long time in some cases and less time in other cases to try and avoid being caught. So the first thing is, what people are, some are calling covert networks, I call them obfuscated because they range from semi-public VPN services in China that the bad guys use. In fact, one of them in particular that was used in a very high profile incident in the UK that's been all over the news, but I can't tell you which one it is, um, uh, was a, a VPN that was sold to dissidents inside China as a secure way of getting out through the Great Firewall of China, but it's also used by Chinese um, uh, hostile uh, state groups. So some of them are like that, some of them are compromised Soho routers, um, and some of them are uh, like tunnels into data centers in Western Europe and the US, um, and then they break out. So the, the spooks are kind of like befuddled by this because they've never had to deal with that sort of stuff before, whereas law enforcement has been dealing with um, banking trojans and loaders and botnets using these multi-tier um, obfuscation networks for a long time. But Anyway, the Chinese are now doing it, and it, it's a challenge, and the churn in these networks is enormous. I think uh, there was one dump I got from um, a partner of ours um, in the United States. I think there was 50,000 IP addresses on it that they'd seen used in different networks in the previous two weeks. So, hide where you're coming from. The second thing is, every man and his dog is now monitoring the endpoint. Um, so... And back when I started all this, you didn't monitor the endpoint, you just left it with antivirus, but you mon monitored the absolute hell out of your edge. You can't install an EDR agent onto your edge. And very often, um, the operating systems or, or whatever on the appliances you've got on your edge don't lend themselves either to alerting or forensics. And we've lost the art of security architecture, but that's a separate story for a, a rant in the, in the pub one day. So, the, so the, the Chinese in particular are going after compromising edge devices, you name it. Um, uh, Pulse Secure, Palo Alto, Manage Engine, um, Volt Typhoon. We worked three Volt Typhoon cases in the, in, in the two years prior to Volt Typhoon being kind of announced. And they were using compromised PRTG servers. If any of you remember MRTG, our RRD tool from the old days, compromised PRTG t servers was what they used. So they get there and they can persist um, without being identified. Um, and in this case, um, you can see someone using... Um, uh, cert util to take a base64 encoded string and, and write a little bit of PowerShell to create a web shell. Living off the land, the Chinese have been doing it for absolute ages. Actually, this is a Volt Typhoon example as well. There is something in that command line which none of you will be able to pick out, but it is a very, very, very strong indicator of bronze silhouette Volt Typhoon um, activity. But yeah, use native tools. Previous um, uh, speaker in here mentioned Shadowpad. Um, Obviously, Shadowpad and PlugX, pretty ubiquitous malware for the Chinese to use for many, many years. What's interesting for us is that we continue to see Shadowpad and PlugX in, um, uh, in Southeast Asia and in places like that, um, in Africa. It, but in Western democracies, in the places where um, uh, you have been embarrassing the Chinese by indicting them, um, they're going much, much more towards native tooling. It's almost like there's two completely different playbooks. Um, so if you're playing in Western Europe or the US, you've kind of abandoned malware that just immediately screams China, uh, and you're focusing purely on operating system um, tools. And then the, the final one is living in the cloud. 
So this actually relates to um, the very interesting and very public and incident I mentioned earlier that involved one of the obfuscated networks where the actor had access, had domain admin and backed off it. They cut themselves uh, an Azure application um, and gave it uh, impersonate any user and access any mailbox. And if any of you read Microsoft blogs carefully, the 0558 stuff last summer, you will know that without an E5 license, you couldn't get the audit log, mail items access, or mail access items, or, or whatever. So the only way you would see this activity is if you had E5 and you're looking at an audit log, and an audit log that actually puts an entry in for every single click on move of an email. Um, so not a particularly useful um, kind of audit log for security. So this is what the bad guys did here. They backed off domain admin into a persistent OAuth token because that's all an Azure app is. It's just a label on an OAuth token. And that's how they kept their stealthy ac access. So yeah, um, lots and lots of advisories and stuff like that on that. And um, subverting uh, authentication systems is not a new thing for China. This is skeleton key. This is a hash being injected into domain controllers on an NGO in London in 2013. And this was a full authentication bypass to Active Directory where you could walk, rock up, type in any SAM account name, and um, you, if you gave this magic password, the skeleton key, um, which interestingly was formed of the, the left-hand side, it was the AD, AD domain of the victim organization. And the right-hand side is something that you could imagine being a code word for the organization if you knew their name. So that told me that they're using it in multiple places. Um, but yeah, so we uncovered this in an instant response job way back then and uh, published a blog on it. And then Tom Brewster picked it up and published that uh, uh, 2015. Um, uh, so that was fun. But if the bad guys were focused on subverting authentication systems back in 2015, you can bet your bottom dollar that they know more about OAuth and SAML assertions than most of us um, today. And of course, the Russians up to the same tricks. Um, so many of you may not know, but we harvested a lot of data around the Russian attacks against the US election in 2015, 2016. Uh, 19,000 bitly links uh, identified 9,000 targets. And what was happening, these were all people who were on um, Google Apps or had a personal Google account and the Russians, would, when you clicked on the link in the email, it was one that said, your account has been compromised. This is from the Google security team. Um, it would man in the middle of it, cut a persistent OAuth token, and then pass you through to Google. And at the time, if you changed the password or you implemented multi-factor auth in Google, it did not invalidate a persistent OAuth token. So the Russians had persistent access to all those mailboxes um, from there on in, which, um, you know, back then, I remember, a couple of years previously, when we uncovered the fact that we're doing that, I was gobsmacked. Um, yeah. And then we have this beauty from, thanks to the SEC, asking companies to do uh, incident summaries if you're floated on the US stock market. Um, so this is the Cloudflare um, stroke Okta compromise, where Okta's blog says, within the course of normal business, Okta support will ask customers to upload a HAR file which allows for troubleshooting. And what happened on this occasion is the threat actor went into the HAR file in the help desk in Okta and stole a session token out of the HAR file and then replayed it against Cloudflare. So, I mean, that sounds almost unbelievable. I mean, almost as unbelievable as the Microsoft story of 0558, which of course we now know, thanks to the CSRB, was a pack of lies. But um, anyway, identity is of course the new perimeter. Um, so let's talk about identity not being the perimeter. So this is an instant response engagement we did uh, in October last year. I was actually walking through South Queensferry. My partner owns a ceramic cafe that's just under the end of the bridge in South Queensferry. And it was our neighbor's 50th birthday. And we're going to be having some cocktails sitting on the wee pier she's got in a ceramic cafe. And I got pinged by one of our IR guys. And he said, can you join a call with a customer right now? And I'm like, it's Saturday, it's 5.30. Um, no, not unless it's really important. And he said, well, the NCSE are joining the call. And I'm like, oh, hang on a minute. If the government's on a call like after 5 p.m. on a Friday, then it's obviously pretty serious. Um, so, you know, it was. Um, so you've got a network perimeter, which looks a bit like that. Um, traffic goes through it. And we're going to think about perimeter routers 
um, on the outside of a customer firewall, almost a service provider router in this case. Um, so what happens here is the bad guys are trying to work out where vulnerable routers are. They want to discover the SNMP private community string, download a co config, batter it in and apply new commands. And this is indeed what happened. In this case, um, the people who called us in were themselves a telco and they were providing services to other companies, unified voice and data services. So there was the actual victim here was one organization which was one of many customers of this telco. And they had 197 sites with exactly the same kind of router in front of them managed by this telco. And it was classic Cisco stuff where they had in the SNMP config lines they had, they had said, here's an ACL, but they hadn't defined the ACL elsewhere in the config, so that just evaluated to null, so there was no ACL. And the SNMP private community string was, guess what, guessable because it was the name of the telco. So the Russians got in and, um, did I say Russians? The perpetrators got in and um, what they did was they went sequentially through each of the 197 routers, set up a GRE tunnel, and mirroring traffic for about four hours, and then moving on to the next one, and then moving on to the next one, and then moving on to the next one. Now, maybe they didn't find anything interesting. Maybe not, I'll come back to that, because that felt very weird. Um, what does that permit? Well, obviously, that just permits that you've got traffic that is now mirrored, and you can grab things, and you can use that to get in. Um, we saw a lot of configuration changes in that time, and this is Moscow time, and the configuration changes only ever occurred between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Moscow time. You can also anticipate that perhaps if you're in Russia that you might like an early lunch at midday, but pattern of life like that kind of really helps you work out who the bad guy you're dealing with here. None of this is new. Who's old enough to remember Cain and Abel? Um, yep. Anyway, NCSC and others have put out advisories saying, please take care um, of, of your routers. In this case, I can't, obviously can't tell you who the ultimate victim was, but if I did, you'd, every single one in here would be scratching the head and saying, no, nah, Russians don't care about this organization. And that was true. Later on, in talking to the telco, um, the people who'd retained us in the telco, it became apparent that the, that voice and data service that they had set up for that victim um, it was a standard package service that they sell to lots of people, including some quite interesting parts of the government. So this whole like work through the routers, four hours of traffic mirroring, move to the next one, four hours, that was just a test. They were just training. Um, and that also explains the interest of NCSE GCHQ in the, um, in the incident. Um, so what sort of thing can happen here? Um, the last time I spoke at Napier was at Basel's thing, and I talked about some really nasty stuff that we'd uncovered um, involving nuclear secrets and all sorts of stuff. We play it down in these blogs. They're very technical. Um, I think the campaign blog, the first one, Resurgent Iron Liberty Targeting Energy Sector, um, we allude to it. I think we have the word nuclear in a very, very small font, but this was a major incident, a sea too high in government parlance, as high a cybersecurity incident as they've ever had, same as Eurofins, another one we worked on. Um, and there was something very interesting about two of the victim organizations here, which is one of the reasons why bad guys do compromise routers. So there was an Adobe Flash player download that came down on these two victims. And when you looked at the MFT, you could see that the file had been rewritten 52 seconds after it arrived. Um, doing the like, timelining of the hard drive, SIFT timeline, whatever it is, whatever tool you use, you could, we could see that the file size that was downloaded um, was different to the file size that ultimately remained on disk. And there was this kind of double write thing. So what is that all about? So what we uncovered was that the, the first download contained the Karagani malware. Um, and it, when it executed, it dropped the malware and then wrote down the legitimate um, Adobe um, installer. You know, a bit like that. Um, now, 
the, the, the requests went straight out to Adobe. And we spoke to Adobe, have you been popped? No, everyone would know a Flash player was popped. Have you got an SWC on your website? That means that only selective people are getting the one that's nicely tainted with Russian malware. And then um, it, it became a known fact that the Russians were sitting on a network just outside the two victims that we had. And suddenly, if any of you have read any Snowden stuff, we managed to work out that what they were doing was the, the Russian equivalent of the quantum insert stuff that, uh, you know, the race condition where you see the request going out and if you just get your, your answer back faster, you can get your tainted download in the hand. So, so you know, if you own the router, uh, you own the network. Okay, this is a little tale from the past, uh, but also from the present. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, the US charged four Iranians with cyber, spitting, cyber, cyber snooping on governments and companies. So there's a nice little DOJ thing, and you've got a FBI most wanted poster for this chap, Kamel Badran Salmani, and an unsealed indictment. Um, now, these next slides were written by Rafe, some of you may know Rafe, who works for me, in 2019 for a NATO Advanced Threats Summit. Um, so not three weeks ago. Um, it says, Obser observation from a cobalt si gypsy, Sinkhole, actually we have revised our attribution long before last, a few years ago. This is a group we call Cobalt Fireside. If any of you get fed up with the whole naming convention nonsense, we've got a Rosetta Stone on our website, which certainly I think is very good. Um, so if you're ever stuck, go and look there. So we, we had bought a domain that had previously been used for, for badness, um, analyticsgoogle.org. Um, and we were sinkholing it and whacking it all into elastic as you do. Um, the reason we bought it was because um, it was um, uh, used as a C2 for uh, Puppy Rat, um, which is an open source rat that is used quite frequently by Iranian bad guys. And we had, you know, whether it was from, I'm not sure whether it was from victims or whether it was from VT harvesting, but we had various different fishes here. We had a, bit, a little bit of metadata and a phone number, a default phone number, which was plus nine six, which is Iran. Um, dates and times when you look at the Iranian stuff is always amazing because they don't hide it and they operate an entirely different calendar to us. So they're on like year 720 or something like that. So it's sometimes quite easy to find it out. Um, so anyway, we're getting lots of connections from Saudi Arabia uh, into our sinkhole, principally from four locations and what was going on here was that these, these were not victims. These were websites that had been set up as strategic web, web compromises or watering holes to sane people who don't like fancy terms. So these were watering holes that were redirecting traffic um, uh, to, to our sinkhole. You know, and the, you know, the majority of traffic came from one of them. We could then see what was in the SWC and see what was in the check-in back with us. So we could see that um, from the JavaScript, that this was what was coming back to us and we were probably running INETSIM or something like that in the sinkhole to be able to capture all of that. So in the SWC code, we had a, a little bit of code like this. You do a bit of Googling, you find a little bit of code like that and you compare them and you're suddenly like, hang on a minute, these are spookily similar. Um, then you look at the timeline of all of this and the similarity of it with other events at the time and you realize that this uh, may very well have been part of the campaign that led to the second wave of Shemun attacks um, in 2016. I'm actually going to mention the first wave of Shemun attacks in a minute. Um, further Googling on handles used uh, threw up this profile and the fact that um, Kamel64 owned the domain pelicnet.ir Back in the day before GDPR completely destroyed who is records, um, we could then find that Kamel Badaran Salmani, do you remember that name? Um, had registered Peleknet.ir and he lived in number 29 Tohid Square, wherever in Tehran. Um, so what is this? Well, if you read that book, and Rafe did, it is uh, an Iranian Revolutionary Guard housing complex uh, for people who work for the IRGC. So, I mean, it's all a bit circumstantial and all the rest of that, but you can see we're pulling a thread here. 
Then, thanks to the Wayback Engine, and I'm going to come back to the Wayback Engine later, um, uh, Rafe managed to work out that our dear friend Camille had actually been uh, away on jihad earlier in his life and had actually been interviewed. We cannot stand by and watch our Hezbollah, the Hezbollah brothers fight alone, said Kamel Badaran. Um, so he was definitely, well, we think these breadcrumbs were, well, we definitely thought these breadcrumbs were enough to tell someone who had better visibility than us about it. But it is just interesting how a little bit of poor OPSEC and an enterprising researcher can pull multiple threads and just get this thing crossing over to identify someone, to work out that he's living in a housing complex that's paid for by the Iranian art military, um, and to see that he's obviously um, uh, been doing things for the Iranians for, for, for some time. So um, we uh, basically shared this research with the FBI office, the Southern District of New York, in 2019. And that, you can see there, is the indictment that was unsealed three weeks ago is from the Southern District of New York. I'm not claiming that we did this because um, our little breadcrumb trail of evidential proof is certainly not strong enough for the FBI, but it's kind of nice that we pinged this over to them five years ago. And um, uh, as one of my researchers said when she sent me a signal, signal message on the night, finally, for fuck's sake. Um, so um, there's also an interesting detail in the indictment. Um, which says social engineering. Members of the conspiracy also use social engineering, which is the use of deception to manipulate individuals into divulging confidential or personal information in order to gain unauthorized access to victim accounts and networks. Generally, the conspirators sent messages to victims from conspirator-created social media accounts with female personas. These messages, blah, 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 often contain links and all the rest of that. So let's look at one of these fake people. Some of you will have definitely seen these slides before. Um, so obviously it's an area of tension, um, Shamoon, uh, no one take a picture of this next slide if I see someone lift their camera up because I said that, um, stop. There's an email when the first Shamoon attack came off which I was forwarded into the chain. I just received a call from Aramco Company Services, the US arm of Saudi Aramco Oil. They have had a security breach worldwide. After initial triage they're asking to purchase 29,000 hard drives of various sizes from Dell and have them delivered to Houston and Saudi as soon as possible. Clearly a tall order, they're getting the request together now. They need our help. I love the fact that um, the author of this, uh, Gary, wrote out 29,000 like a check in numbers and then in words, just in case you didn't get it. Now obviously, you know, destructive attacks are not a, 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 you know, they're not an uncommon thing these days. But back when this happened, this was un unheard of, and Aramco, you know, allegedly one of the largest companies in the world. Um, anyway, our old friend Puppy Rat um, was, was involved there, um, and um, lots of Puppy Ratty things. Six weeks after a fishing campaign, post Shamoon, when Aramco was in recovery, and we were working with one of their major subcontractors, uh, one of the victims asked us to analyze a piece of malware, and it was puppy rat. And we could see with our customer that uh, we had been stopping lots and lots of phishing attempts. Lots and lots and lots. So what happens if you can't get in through the normal way? Well, you do a bit of social engineering. So meet Mia Ash. So Mia Ash is a photographer in South Staffordshire. Um, she's reaching out, out to people around the world um, to say hello because she's an altruistic, nice person. So she reach out, reaches out to a young guy from South Asia who is a, a, a privileged user uh, working at her customer and wants to be his friend. And initially he is like super suspicious, but she is very persistent. So they start communicating on Gmail, on WhatsApp, um, and uh, then we have a situation where he says, she says, I've got a questionnaire for you, can you fill it in? So he, he gets the questionnaire, she says, this is gonna work better if you do it on your work computer. So he forwards it to his work computer. And you know what happened. And you see the email there. Dear Mia, due to your file, I am in trouble now because this file is having a virus issue. Mia's Facebook, lots and lots of stuff, just building a real persona 
a real persona that was maintained uh, for a lengthy period of time um, in order to manipulate people into installing malware. LinkedIn, um, very well put together, loads of connections, mostly in India and Saudi Arabia. One of the victims, which we hadn't identified, victim A, um, we, we reckoned because of what we could see in public social media that they had been in contact for about 300 days. Victim A worked for one of the big four. Um, uh, so that was interesting. The other victim, of course, um, is, uh, is the lady concerned, um, whose name I've forgotten right now, which is probably quite good, but um, whose identity had been completely stolen. And she is a photographer in Romania, and her Instagram feed is just pure gold for someone who wants to set up a catfish because um, she has so many different pictures in so many different scenarios. It's um, because she's very well traveled. So if you wanted a picture of me Ash skiing, you could get a picture of her skiing. If you wanted her in a park in Paris, you could, you could get that. So there's a very, very rich and diverse um, uh, kind of set of photographs that they managed to take from, um, from this lady. We published it and uh, went out in a blog and then lots of people wrote it up and the high spot of my career is that the Daily Mail wrote it up. Um, one week after we went public, Victor May, the one that had been in contact for 300 days, reached out to Alison, who was my um, researcher that was focusing on this at the time. And uh, she, she knew exactly who he was. We'd identified him. And she, I remember her ringing me up going, Victor May's reached out. And she said, right, I'm going to play it cool. So she replied saying, I don't normally add people who I don't know. Why have you sent their connection request? And he said, I've read your comments. If you were involved in the investigation, you may know I am victim A, mentioned under Appendix B. I was wondering if you would like to talk to us, talk to him. So we had, we had a chat with him, and um, it was just horrific. He had been registering domains for her. He had been uploading files to his workplace. It was in the big four. Um, and uh, he, had, he had no clue, really, he had been duped. He said, I doubted her intentions, but I never once doubted that she was a real person. After our blog post came out, after everything was published, um, we could still see um, victim A now starting to comment on the real Romanian lady's social media, which is a bit freaky because he never had a relationship with anyone other than the IRGC. So it was, it was creepy as anything. And at that time, he'd moved to work for one of the other big four. So all the circle stuff is um, this young man commenting. And I knew the guy who does the kind of government engagement for that big four. And I called him up and said, you have a young man you need to take aside and explain to him that he's commenting on a lady's profile that um, uh, he's never met. And it was a bit like the catfish episode where the guy said, I'm talking to Katy Perry. And even right at the end, he thought the whole program was a fit up that he was still talking to Katy Perry. He just hadn't got it. So archive.org. Um, cyber proliferation. Again, the, the chap who spoke previously was um, talking about NSO group. Cyber proliferation is a, is a real problem. And it's a, it's, a, it's a real problem emanating from Israel. It's a real problem emanating from India. Um, you may still be able to read this Andy Greenberg article. A startup allegedly hacked the world, then came the censorship and now the backlash. So this is Appen Group in um, India, which is owned by a billionaire who doesn't like people saying that his companies are hacking the world. So a good friend of mine, Raphael Satter at Royal Fatim, having dinner with Raphael in um, Washington DC on Monday. Is that tomorrow? Day after tomorrow. Um, he wrote a fantastic deep dive on Appen Group, published it. Reuters were then uh, sent uh, legal letters from a court in India um, asking them to remove the article, and they bowed to pressure, which is not good in the first place. So I was trying to catch up on Raphael's article because he was messaging me and saying, it's been pulled, did you read it? And I hadn't. I thought, well, that's easy. I'm just going to go to the Wayback Engine and have a wee look at Raphael's article in the Wayback Engine. Go to the Wayback Engine, and the URL has been excluded from the Wayback Machine. So the, um, 
the Indians had, uh, the court in India had got in touch with the Wayback Machine and also threatened them, so they removed the cash from the Wayback Machine. Um, the EFF have got involved to try and help. Citizen Lab are, as they would be, typically um, pissed off about it. So the letter on the left there is a the letter they received asking them to take down their blog, commenting on App and Group stuff, and you can see how Ron Debert responded um, with a single finger at the bottom of his, um, his tweet there. If you're interested in App and Group, and you should be, then go to ddossecrets.com slash wiki slash app and uncensored because it's still there. Raphael's article is still there. And whether I agree with Raphael's article or not, I really object to a court in India resulting in things getting removed from the Wayback Machine. Um, so, so yeah, archive.org. <sighs> and then, fake NGO, which some of you will have seen before. Um, who's seen the fake NGO story before? Come on. Right, you can tell how old this is because um, they were still building the stadiums for the World Cup in this uh, famous footballing nation. Um, and what was happening was the health and safety was um, appalling. I was actually in Qatar and I met the Center for the Continuing Excellence of the Qatari State or whatever, but the sort of quango that was building the stadiums, I went for a meeting with them and they were really quite kind of candid. They sort of said, oh, we look to Dubai and like they've sort of become Disneyland and we're not and the gas is going to run out at some point, so we need to make sure that we become a holiday destination. And he, I think the phrase he used is something like, we made sure we got the World Cup so we could use that as a catalyst for becoming a holiday destination. And of course now Qatar is kind of on the list of holiday destinations, so they've sort of succeeded. Anyway, lots of people are getting hurt in the building sites. Um, uh, I think they have more stadium capacity fourfold over than the number of actual Qatari citizens, which is not the number of people in the country, but the number of citizens. Um, Washington Post puts out this thing saying, look at the total of human casualties in Qatar. Um, Qatar is outraged about this, and at this point, um, a charity called Voiceless Victims appears. And they look like a general human rights charity, but if you kind of dig into it a little bit, you could see they were sort of focusing on um, what was going on in Qatar with building the um, stadiums. So a customer of ours reached out and said, um, and this is quite a long time ago, it's probably 2014, um, and said, I'm really worried about this, I'm worried about um, fake news, and fake news was a new thing then. Um, I'm worried about the reputation of human rights organizations. I'm worried about whistleblowers contacting a fake organization and who knows what might, might happen to them. So we started to take a look at it. We did a pattern of life on the tweets from Voiceless Victims. Voiceless Victims are supposed to be in the UK, Paris and Madrid. What can anyone tell me about that pattern of life for people based in Western Europe? Qatari. Yeah, it's the Qatari week. What about the time of day? They're getting up very early for Western Europe, aren't they? So, yep. Uh, when they sent an email to our customer saying, hey, let's collaborate, um, they used a VPN. That may be standard if you are in the human rights world, so let's not, uh, you know, labor that point. Um, the guy who's running it was a chap called Luke Han, and he had been running it for, how many years does it say? Seven years. He has no connections on LinkedIn. He needs to learn from Mia Ash. Mia had 500 connections on LinkedIn. You know, if you're going to build a fake social media profile, at least try. Anyway, um, so yeah, zero connections, working for 15 years, and a law degree from Oxford. So Tom Brewster reached out to, uh, well, so Tom Brewster reached out to journalists at Le Monde and at a paper in Spain. They doorstepped the offices. No one had ever heard of voiceless victims. They were totally convinced it was utterly fake. So Tom was going to put his story out in Forbes. So he reached out to Luke on LinkedIn and said, this is your right of reply. I'm about to out you as an entirely fake organization. Uh, and Luke replied, and bear in mind this next bit. This chap apparently has a law degree from Oxford, and I went to school in Dunfermline, right? So, um, dear Thomas, thank you for the email. Let's go to the second paragraph. Unfortunately, since we started this campaign, we received various threats. 
We sincerely hope that your information isn't coming from the same ones who are trying to bring us down and prevent the truth about foreign workers' situation in Qatar to be told. So I ran out of breath at the end of that second sentence. I went to school in Dunfermline, I know where to put a comma in, and this guy who has a law degree from Oxford and doesn't know how to do that. So um, the fake non-profit has been accused of spying on real human rights activists. That day, their website went from this to that. So apparently I'm a bad guy, so the bad guy's won. So the fake NGO is gone. And the 24 update is, whilst chatting to Raphael Satter about some technical details of that campaign, it looks very much like Appen Group were behind the technical aspects of that campaign in cyber non-proliferation. So there we go. I have no idea if overrun or not. That's everything for me. Thank you very much.